what event in your area over the last 12 months are we actually still going to be talking about in the next 12 months? Let's start off with Joel. What do we think? Okay, well, um, I'll begin my answer by apologizing to Yannicka because I suspect I may be giving the same answer as her, um, which is in UK E relations, I think the Windsor framework is kind of really a defining uh, moment and a moment which will continue to define relations for some time to come. Because if we think about where UK E relations were a year ago, they were fundamentally stuck. No progress is being made on anything really because of the impasse over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And now that that has been unlocked, so to speak, there are still issues which need to be worked through around the Windsor framework, but broadly speaking, it has smoothed out political relations. That means you can start to have conversations that you couldn't have uh, previously. And that sets a totally different context on the dynamic between the two countries. You only have to look at um, James Cleverley's speech yesterday that he gave to the uh, Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, where he said, you know, more or less, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, we are constructive partners who want to work together and where we have differences, they are things that we can overcome, not things that, you know, have to push us apart. So it's a it's a normalization of that relationship, if you like. And uh, that's something that we haven't had for a long time in our UK relations. So that's why I think it will uh, continue to define kind of a, a new uh, era in the relationship. Well, Yannicka, do we uh, have agreement or a controversial opinion on the state of the relationship? Yeah, no surprise there. Um, I agree with Joelle um, that the Windsor framework was uh, probably the most significant moment for EU-UK relations in the past 12 months. I think going forward, um, the focus will now be on, on implementation. So um, the EU in particular have said um, they will be um, looking for proper and full implementation of the Windsor framework, um, which will be in stages up until 2025. So I think the focus will now be on that. Um, if I had to choose um, something else uh, rather than the Windsor framework um, and looking a bit outside of the UK um, and more towards the EU, I would probably say the um, European Council Summit last year in June um, at which um, EU leaders decided to grant candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova, which I think in the current kind of geopolitical climate um, was a very significant moment and is going to sh shape um, European politics and how the EU and its institutions look um, for, for years to come. That's certainly true. And I know that we're going to be diving uh, more into that, that EU-UK relationship later on. But Sophie, let's let's think back in the UK. What What's your moment of the last 12 months that we'll still be talking about in 12? I think so much just happened. That is hard to really like sort of single it down to one particular moment. But as someone who's sort of quite interested in, you know, UK politics and public opinion, and particularly as we've got an election coming up, I would probably go for something quite recent, which is the resignation of uh, or several Tory MPs in the last few weeks, which has been caused by elections uh, in the next few months. Just because I think really as we enter an election period, uh, in the UK, how Rishi Sunak's party performs and those will really, I think, give us a signal of what we can expect from the election next year and I think it'll be seen as sort of a really important moment in how the Tory party sort of begins to formulate its electoral strategy um, as we approach 2024, uh, really, and I think we'll see, we'll be able to sort of trace it all back to the results of these by-elections that will come in the next few months. So three very key events that no doubt we will be talking about over the next 12 months. But Stephen, what's yours before we dive into UK politics? Yeah, I would definitely say that inflation is not something that we will, uh, it's going to be going away in the next uh, 12 months. We are still going to be see the, seeing the effects of it, especially as the Bank of England tries to get down to its 2% um, and, you know, Rishi Sunak gets his goal of, you know, having inflation inflation by the end of the year. And so um, this is going to be something that's going to be on the minds of politicians and economic uh, economists and uh, the public as well as it starts to we start to already see the effects on mortgages. That promise of, of having inflation was certainly one of the, the key goals of Rishi Sunak in this year of three prime ministers. But Sophie, where where the Conservative Party at right now in the polls? What do you see? So Labour has a pretty consistent poll over the con the polls that lead over the Conservatives in the poll, sorry, um, over the last sort of more than a year, probably 18 months now. 
Um, I think the latest poll from Redfields and Wilton that came out today put them at an 18% lead over the Conservatives, I believe. Um, so, you know, they're in a pretty difficult place elect electorally. But I think the really significant thing about, you know, there being so much change in the leadership of not just the country, but the Conservative Party in the last, uh, you know, year, is that it really crystallises how divided that party is. This is, as a result, I think mainly of that very sort of broad electoral coalition that Boris Johnson managed to uh, build in 2019. But realistically, the one thing that really did unite that coalition was Brexit. And we've seen that becoming decreasingly important to uh, the electorate over the last year, particularly as things, you know, as they're unable to pay for, you know, basic goods, the cost of living crisis is becoming less and less important. What that means is that coalition, you know, there's nothing to hold it together. These are a group of voters with very different, uh, you know, values, economic preferences. It's very difficult to unite them in one singular policy in a way that in the way that Boris Johnson did essentially. And I think by seeing the shift through the three prime ministers, we kind of seen the three sort of elements to the Conservative Party, if you will. You've got that very sort of radical growth first coalition of Liz Truss. You've got a bit more maybe a technocratic, maybe more traditional Conservative Party that's embodied by Rishi Sunak. And then you've got those people who lent their votes to the Conservative Party maybe the, for the first time in 2019, which are generally, you know, more liberal on um welfare, on tackling inequality, but maybe somewhat more uh, socially conservative, which is sort of embodied by Boris Johnson. And I think those sort of transition through those three prime ministers in the last year has really showed just how divided that Conservative Party is and why it will be so difficult for the, the next election to put forward kind of one united front. I'm seeing Slido already lighting up, including by some of my favourite people. So hello out there. Um, but some of the questions are, are pushing towards, well, is, is Brexit just no longer an issue? And uh, one question is asking, well, how should Brexit be played, if at all, by either the Labour uh, Party or the Conservatives or by any of the other parties? Yeah, I mean, what we've seen is that, I think, as I just mentioned very briefly, the importance of Brexit. So if you ask sort of voters what they think their main priority should be um, or what their main priority party should be as we approach the next election, um, Brexit and the UK-EU relationship has just kind of plummeted in importance. Um, it's been outside of, I think, the top 10 issues on YouGov's issues tracker for quite a long time. Now it's nowhere near the importance that it was, you know, even two, three years ago. So it's just not an issue that's concerned voters. Instead, what we see is the economy is number one pretty consistently, followed by, by health and now immigration. So I'm not saying that you can untie all those issues from Brexit, from leaving the EU. Obviously, they're all interlinked. But in voters' heads, it's just not a priority at, at the moment. And so I do genuinely think that this next election campaign will be the first you know, non-Brexit election that we've had since the referendum. Um, just because it's not, well, firstly, because it's not a priority for voters, as I've just said. And secondly, to come on to that question about um, parties, it's not particularly in any party's interest to make this an issue. You know, Labour finds it a pretty difficult issue to reckon with because it splits their voter base down the middle. You've got, you know, a lot of Labour voters that were voted to remain in 2016 and want a closer relationship with the EU. At the same time, they want to try and win back the votes in those sort of heavily leave voting constituencies, where which may have flipped the Conservatives for the first time in 2019. So it suits them to keep relatively quiet on this issue, particularly as they're not proposing anything, you know, particularly radical, as I'm sure Yannicka can go into more detail on when it comes to changing the UK-EU relationship in the future. For the Tories, for the reasons I just said, you know, maybe you think they would want to go for it because you know, go for Brexit, I mean by that, because it would unite that electoral coalition. But realistically, Rishi Sunak would very easily be attacked for taking too sort of weak an approach to the EU from an electorate that very much liked, you know, Boris Johnson's quite irate approach to UK-EU relations. We are seeing a more sort of pragmatic, friendly approach. And, you know, that's just not to the taste of a lot of 2019 Conservative voters, really. So, you know, I think it's not going to be an issue because voters aren't really bothered about it at the moment. And it's not really in the party's strategic interests to talk about it very much.